All right, well, this evening we're going to continue in Luke chapter 4. And uh, this time we're going to uh, bite off a sizable chunk, and that is the, the account of uh, Jesus coming to his hometown uh, in order to minister the gospel and the reception that he gets, which, which was at first warm, but then turned out not to be quite so warm. Um, but again, uh, knowing what would take place, Jesus was willing uh, to do it. So let's read about it first, and then we'll take a look at it in our sermon. It's uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through verse 30. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district, and he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth that there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way." Well, may the Lord bless this part of his word to um, uh, our hearing uh, this evening. Now, just as a reminder, this morning uh, we, we saw Jesus going into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Remember uh, that the first Adam had to face the devil uh, in the garden, and um, uh, he failed. Uh, where the first Adam failed, the second Adam had to come now and face the same tempter and overcome him. So we saw that, that, first of all, he was tempted by the devil. Secondly, we saw how the devil went about his temptation. Remember, it was the same three-pronged approach that he used to overcome Adam and Eve, and the same approach that he's used successfully against the majority of the world. Uh, Satan essentially, as we saw this morning, uh, through these tactics will destroy the majority of mankind. And he does it by appealing to bodily desires and even needs, by parading things in front of our eyes by which to tempt us, and by promising us certain things that might enhance our self-worth or our self-value. But of course, uh, these things had really uh, nothing to hold on to in the Lord Jesus. He was not, uh, he may have been tempted, uh, at least in a certain sense. He sensed the temptation, but he had no desire for th anything evil. And we saw how Jesus overcame this temptation uh, and how we can as well. And the first is by being aware of the character of the one who is coming to us, the fact that he will come to us. We're warned in Scripture that we need to uh, keep a watch out for the devil because he is continually coming to us and seeking to basically deceive us. 
uh, to tempt us into certain sins and, of course, deceive us as to what the truth is and what the Word of God says. We need to be aware of his character, first of all, that he is a liar, that there is no truth in him. But we also need to do what Jesus did. We need to compare what it is he is telling us with what God says in his word. And knowing what God says, being filled with the Spirit and by the power of the Spirit, choosing to do what is right. You know, the sad truth is that we often believe really only what we want to believe. But God has given to us his Holy Spirit so that we might see what the Word of God says, so that we want to get into it and find out, and so that we will actually want to do it. We do need to beware of Satan's deceptions. Now, this evening, we see that having defeated the devil, and the devil having retreated uh, for the time being until an opportune time, which will come at the end when Jesus is handed over to the power of darkness in order to be crucified, uh, Jesus now begins his ministry, um, and so we might actually say as we, as we look at what's going on here, that this is in fact another attack uh, of the enemy, only it may not necessarily be inspired by Satan directly, but it certainly is by the hearts of these Nazarenes. This evening, let's consider the difficulty that Jesus faced in, the, in his hometown of Nazareth. Now, the first thing Luke tells us about is Jesus' popularity in Galilee. He tells us that when he returned to Galilee, and by the way, Nazareth is in Galilee, so is Capernaum, and he's going to make reference to Capernaum. Uh, in, he does make reference in our text. He returns in the power of the Holy Spirit. He begins his ministry, apparently by uh, open-air preaching. You know, he preaches openly, he performs miracles, and the news about him begins to spread throughout the region. Eventually, Luke tells us he was welcomed by the synagogues to teach in them, uh, having now gained recognition as a competent rabbi or teacher, and he was praised by all. But Luke goes on to tell us that there was one place that wasn't quite as welcoming, and that happened to be his hometown. We see in verse 16 that he comes to Nazareth. And as was his custom, he enters the synagogue on the Sabbath in order that he might worship his father. Again, let me just point to this as an example of what the Lord would have us to do. Jesus is God's most faithful son. And he was one who kept the Sabbath holy as the law required. And part of keeping that holy was gathering with God's people in order to worship him. Now, again, we are to follow this example even as we are to follow every other example of our Lord Jesus. Now, on this particular occasion, he was asked to read. Uh, not, not, you know, we're not really too familiar with synagogue worship, I think, but um, those who are would remind us that during a worship service in the synagogue, there would be several people who would read Scripture. As a matter of fact, seven in a, in a typical service. There would be a priest present who would read. There would be a Levite present. And then five other Jewish men who were connected with the synagogue, who were members of the synagogue. Um, and it's interesting, too. I don't know if every one of them expounded the scriptures that they read. But in this case, Jesus certainly did. Now, it's likely that they asked Jesus to do this, uh, not just because he grew up there, and uh, had been a member of the synagogue and perhaps had read on other occasions as he was uh, growing up, but likely because they had heard of his reception in the other synagogues in Galilee and wanted to hear his teaching, wanted to see how well he could do it. Uh, Luke writes that in verse 17, Jesus gets up to read, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Now, another interesting thing to note here is that uh, sometimes we think that um, maybe Jesus had a choice of books. You know, hand me the, the scroll of Isaiah. But it really wasn't Jesus' choice as to what book he would read or any of the readers, but essentially the minister of the synagogue would choose the book. And he would also choose the text. In this case, the uh, minister of the synagogue chose Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, which just happened in God's providence 
to be about the Messiah. So Jesus found the passage and he began to read in Luke 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now, it's quite likely the Jews understood this passage to refer to Messiah's coming, but his coming to free them from the tyranny of an oppressive uh, government, that of Rome. But this passage was really referring to the work that our Lord Jesus Christ would do when he came, which was primarily the freeing of his people from the tyranny of sin and of Satan. Now, Isaiah tells us what it is that Messiah would do. Messiah would be anointed by the Holy Spirit, which Jesus was, of course, empowered to preach the gospel, that he would preach this gospel to the poor. Now, he certainly did to those who, who had very little, but we know that poor can mean a couple of different things in Scripture. It can refer to somebody who's destitute because God has chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith. Or it can also refer to those who are poor in spirit, those who are humbled by their sins. And Jesus was already doing this. Messiah would proclaim release to the captives. He would set free those who are oppressed. And that's what Jesus was doing by preaching the gospel. He was freeing those who were bound by the devil and by their sin, setting them free so that they might live a holy life, the kind of life God calls us to live, no longer bound by their sinful desires. He came that he might make the blind to see. Now, Jesus did this literally. He healed blind people on several occasions, but he did that primarily to show the Jews that what he was able to do spiritually, that he was able to open the eyes of those blinded by their sins, to show them the reality and the truth and the beauty of the things that the Lord has to say, to see the beauty of the Messiah himself and to believe in him and to be saved. That's what it means to open the eyes of the blind, to see the beauty of God's ways and to go that direction. And then finally, that the Messiah might proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, which is really a reference to the year of Jubilee. You know, Jubilee, I think, came every 50 years. And when that time would come, those who had sold themselves into slavery uh, in order to pay for their debts were set free. That's why if somebody was actually going to do that, uh, they, the, the person would only pay as much as, uh, as they could serve up until the year of Jubilee. And there were people also who sold their properties uh, and you know, their, their inheritance in order to get money to pay their debts. And when the year of Jubilee came, everything was forgiven and all the properties returned to their rightful owners. So this is what the Lord has actually come to do, what the Messiah has come to do. He has come to proclaim this year of Jubilee, only in this case, it was their sins and their debts to God's justice that would be forgiven uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting that um, this passage is the very one that um, Jesus will point to when John the Baptist, when he's in prison, will send two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one we should expect or should we be looking for someone else? Jesus will respond by pointing to his ministry that fulfills this passage. Uh, we'll see this later in Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 7, verses 22 through 23. And he answered and said to them, to these messengers, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. So again, this passage Jesus read was referring to the Messiah, it was referring to him. And he was already fulfilling what it had to say. So we see that when Jesus finished reading, he gave the book back to the minister. And then he sat down. Now, he didn't sit down because he was done. He sat down because in those days, the one who was teaching, after he'd read the scriptures, he'd stand up to, to read the scriptures out of respect for the Lord. 
And then he would sit down in order to teach. And so as he sat down, everyone in the synagogue looked at him, and they were waiting to hear what he had to say. I think another thing that's really interesting here is that uh, the person who would read and then expound the text didn't even have the text in front of them anymore. <laughs> they, all they had was memory to go on. He read it. He handed the book back. He sat down with no notes or anything else and begins to, to preach. And we know certainly that Jesus would have no difficulty uh, doing that. Well, we know there was already an expectation that Messiah is coming what was near. I mean, that's what John was preaching. People were asking, are you, are you the Messiah? Are you the expected one? He says, no, it's not me, but I've, I've come to prepare his way. He's coming after me. And these Nazarenes had also heard what Jesus had been doing throughout Galilee, and likely that John the Baptist pointed to him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So there might have been some suspicion on their part of what Jesus may have had to say, but it doesn't really seem as though we were, they were prepared for what Jesus says next in verse 21. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, at first, they were impressed by Jesus, by his ability to speak. No one has ever spoken as this man speaks. He speaks with authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees. And they were speaking well of him and were amazed at his gracious words. But then it seems that reality began to set in. What is he actually saying? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the son of Joseph? Uh, isn't this the one whom we've known for 30 years? And they were offended at him. Now, we need to understand that to, to really see what's coming next because Jesus knew what it was that they were thinking. He knew it because of the Spirit of God, but he also could hear what, what they were saying. And so he begins to address what it is that was welling up inside their hearts, perhaps to try to bring them to repentance before they chose the particular course of action which they eventually chose. He says to them in verse 23, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Now, I think physician heal yourself is, is a, um, an expression that we're familiar with. It was a Jewish saying that meant that one should deal, first of all, with their own faults before they try to minister to others. You know, Jesus said something similar. He tells us that we should do the same thing. Take the log out of your eye before you try to take the speck out of somebody else's eyes. So, Jesus, uh, first of all, Deal with your own delusions of self-grandeur before you presume to minister to us. And then they further challenged him to prove his claim uh, to being the Messiah by doing the miracles that they had heard that he had done in Capernaum. By the way, we need to recognize that um, by this time, Jesus uh, had settled in Capernaum. Jesus had taught in Capernaum. He had done many miracles in Capernaum. And as we've already seen, the news about him was spreading throughout all the region of Galilee. But we, as we also saw, Luke said, the majority of Galilee was, um, was receiving him. And, and they were very excited about what he had to say. But the same was not true about these Nazarenes. Now the question is, why did they reject him when the majority of the Galileans actually welcomed him? And that's really the point of the text. Jesus tells us that it's because, in verse 24, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Now, every prophet is basically born like anyone else, right? And uh, they're raised in a family and they're raised in a town. Um, but if he happens to be from your town or worse, from your family, uh, you're going to be much less likely to listen to what he has to say or believe what he has to say. Familiarity breeds contempt. Jesus, this this, this kid that I played with when I was a child that I grew up with, this is the Messiah. Or as the parents looking at this child, uh, even though he was a very good child, a very perfect child, they're still not willing to accept this because they know who he is. Now Jesus next points out the danger of this attitude, the danger of this kind of contempt, of this unwillingness to accept uh, him as the Messiah. 
He points to two Old Testament examples to show what this kind of hardness of heart can actually do, that it can turn God's mercy away from them to someone else. That's really what's behind what he says in verses 25 through 27. Jesus says this, but I say to you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. So essentially what Jesus is saying is that because his own people hardened their heart against God and they refused to listen to him and to his prophet, he turned away from them and he showed mercy to those who were outside the covenant. He turned away from his own people and he showed mercy to these two Gentiles. He fed this poor woman, this poor widow who was uh, in Zarephath and he healed Naaman the Syrian, who was the leader of the armies of Syria. Now, Jesus is essentially telling these Nazarenes, these Jews in the synagogue, the same will happen to you if you harden your hearts against God. Now, this is really a prelude, isn't it, to what's going to happen to Israel as a whole. They were going to reject Jesus, and he was going to send the gospel instead to the Gentiles. Now, everywhere that Paul and the apostles went when they were doing their missionary journeys, they went to the Jews first, but when they rejected, they turned to the Gentiles, and after all of Israel heard the gospel, then God brought judgment on that nation in 70 AD, and the gospel has gone out to the world ever since. God isn't entirely done with Israel. We know that he's turned to the Gentiles to provoke the Israelites to jealousy so that they will also receive him but it was their hardness of heart that made God turn to the Gentiles and actually bring the gospel to us. Jesus is warning them about the consequences of rejecting him on the basis of their familiarity. But finally, we see their response. Um, what he had to say was not blessed by the Lord or by the Holy Spirit. Uh, they responded in much the same way that that those Stephen was speaking to, remember, when he was arrested and he was before the Sanhedrin and he indicted them with their crimes and their sins against the Lord, they turned into a mob and they rushed on him to kill him. Well, essentially, the same thing happens here. The synagogue turns into a mob with only one goal, and that is kill Jesus. Luke writes in verses 28 and 29, and all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. You know, instead of letting these things basically be a reproof that could correct them and get them to go the right direction, instead they hardened their hearts against it and they would not listen. They instead became angry and they wanted to, well, essentially kill Jesus. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. Now, again, let's remember who these people are that, that are about to do this. This was not some mob of, um, uh, you know, Gentiles living in darkness. The, these were basically God's people, right? This was the Old Testament church. And more than that, these were people that Jesus knew for 30 years, right? These were his friends. These were his neighbors. These were the people he grew up around. And yet, this is the way they responded to him. They dragged him out of their synagogue out of their city, to the edge of a hill on which the, the, basically the city had been built to throw him off a cliff. And the intent, of course, was to execute him, to execute him without even a trial. But as we know, this was just the beginning of Jesus' ministry. His time had not yet come. Luke writes in verse 30, but passing through their midst, he went on their way. It, it seems kind of strange, doesn't it? Here's this angry mob that's dragging Jesus to the edge of the cliff, and suddenly Jesus walks to the middle of them and goes his way. Now, what happened here was that the, uh, the people of, of, of Nazareth wanted to see a miracle like they had seen in Capernaum, and here was a miracle. Uh, they were going to throw him off the cliff, but they suddenly stopped, 
And he walked right through the middle of the crowd as though he wasn't even there. But yet it was a miracle that they were somewhat unaware of. They don't even know what happened and where Jesus went. Suddenly, Jesus was gone. Now, the saddest thing about this was that Messiah came to them to show them the way of salvation, but they wouldn't listen to him. And instead, really, of their knowing him, working to their advantage, it actually worked against them. Jesus says, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. So what can we learn from this example of Jesus? Well, the first thing, of course, that we need to learn is that Jesus has come to offer us salvation, to offer salvation to the world, to those who will receive him. That's what Isaiah tells us the mission of the Messiah was. That's what his coming was all about. He came to preach good news, good news that we can be reconciled to God. It's the favorable year of the Lord, complete remission of sin. He's come to preach good news, but to those who are humble, to those who by his grace actually see their spiritual poverty, actually admit their sins, their debt to God's justice, those who want his forgiveness. You know, unless we, we see our need, we're never really going to want him. So we have to be humbled first by the burden of our sins. Remember Pilgrim's Progress, how Christian, actually, well, Pilgrim, Christian, he was called Christian, even in the city of destruction, was humbled by the, the burden on his back. Okay, how can I get rid of this? Well, Jesus came to show us that. Jesus has come to open the eyes of those who are spiritually blind. And we all come into this world blind to the things of the Lord. That's why so few people actually read the Bible. And of those who read it, so few actually see anything in it that is of any value and want to continue to read it and actually listen to it and do what it says. So he has come to take away that natural blindness, to open the eyes of the blind and to reveal the beauty of his ways, his beauty also of who he is. He came to set free those who are bound by the devil, to break the power of sin in their hearts by giving them a love for what is good. You know, that's what that spiritual sight gives you by the Holy Spirit. When you see something beautiful, something you find beautiful, your heart goes out to it. That's why the eyes, we have to watch out. That's one of the avenues that the devil will attack us. He'll parade something in front of our eyes to get us to want it, right? But when the Lord opens our eyes to something that is beautiful, it makes us desire it. And that desire, that love we have now for those things is what actually sets us free from the bondage that Satan had us under because before we could see that beauty and desired it, all we wanted was sin. And so we were bound by our own hearts, by the enemy. Well, Jesus has come to break that power by giving us love for what is good by his Holy Spirit. Now, if we don't know the Lord, this is what he says he will do for us if we will only receive him. And if we do know him, we need to remember that this is really what our Lord Jesus wants us to offer others and what he will do through his gospel as we share it with others. Secondly, I think we see from this example of Jesus that if we follow him, if we identify with him, if we stand for his values, that we're going to be treated like Jesus was treated by those who don't share these same values uh, by the world. Uh, Jesus, again, reminds us in John 15, verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. The world would love you. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. This is really one way that, that Jesus told us, too, that we can know that we actually belong to him, is that we're not loved by the world, but we're hated by the world because we are different from the world. Now, the closer that um, we are to those who are of the world, the more likely Jesus, from his example, shows us that we're going to be hated by them. Familiarity breeds contempt. Remember on one occasion, Jesus said, don't think that I came to bring peace. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. From now on, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. I haven't necessarily come to unite households. I've come to divide them. 
And where does that division actually come? It comes because there's going to be some who love Jesus and there's going to be some who don't love Jesus and they're going to be as different as night and day. So Jesus reminds us that if we're going to follow him, it means that we're also going to suffer some hatred from family members, from friends, from the world, right? But third, his uh, example reminds us that we need to be willing to speak the truth even if we will be hated for doing it. Notice Jesus knew what was in the hearts of all men, but he didn't hold back even though he knew what the result of this, you know, this reading and this exposition in the synagogue would be. And neither did Jesus stop when he saw their ire beginning to rise. As a matter of fact, he continued to preach and he continued to defend what he was saying in the hopes of getting them to repent. And of course, he trusted that his father would keep him until his work was finished. You know, Jesus, when his time was not yet, he was protected by his father until the time came when he was handed over to the enemy and the power of darkness in order to die for our sins. Now, we need to be willing to do what the Lord calls us to do. Jesus said, remember, on more than one occasion, we need to be willing to pick up our crosses. We need to be willing to die. We need to be willing to give our lives. Uh, we, we have to count the cost before we begin to follow Jesus. There is a cost that is involved, and it wasn't just among uh, first century Judaism, but it's particularly in the world in which we live today. We need to be willing to pay this price, but we also need to be willing to trust that the Lord will protect us. I mean, the reason why we're here this evening is because the Lord has protected us, right? He's kept us safe all of these years. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we are essentially invincible until it's our time to go home. And our time is not in our hands. It's not in the hands of men. Remember what Jesus said to um, Pilate, I believe it was, you have, there's nothing in your hands. You, you, uh, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from heaven. Okay? God is the one who is sovereignly in control of whether we're going to live or die, whether we're going to be injured or not injured. Uh, now, we need, we, we need to understand that doesn't mean that we're never going to get hurt. But we, we see that um, the, the apostles had to go through a great deal. Paul suffered a lot, uh, perhaps more than anyone else except for our Lord Jesus who suffered God's wrath on the cross for us. Uh, Peter also, Silas, and many others. But it does mean that we cannot be killed until the Lord allows it. By the way, we can't get hurt either unless the Lord allows it. And when he allows it, it is only for his glory, right? Paul knew that he had been appointed to suffer for Jesus. And that is essentially how the kingdom of God advances is through the suffering of God's people. When the Lord places a holy people in an unholy world, this is going to be the result. But we need to be willing to do this for him as he also did this for us because this is the way that he gathers his people to himself even as he gathers us. It doesn't always mean that we're going to have to suffer, but if it means that, we need to be willing to do that for his glory. So may this example of our Lord Jesus encourage all of us to be willing to do these things for him. And may he give us this heart and this power by his Holy Spirit. Remember, this is one of the reasons why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's because when we are filled with the Spirit, then we will desire and we will do what our Lord wants us to do. Well, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to follow Jesus in this.